I was telling my companions about a trip I had recently made to Vegas. Not normally my idea of a place to go, but the Sci-Fi Channel had flown me down there to take part in a panel discussion. One of the other panelists was Lucy Lawless. Now, if you're not an SF kind of person, then I will probably have to tell you that she is an actor best known for her title role on the television series Xena, Warrior Princess, and more recently appearing on Battlestar Galactica. If you are an SF person, you already know this and much more about her. Well, it turned out that our waiter that evening, contrary to appearances, was very much an SF person. And as soon as he heard me mention the name of Lucy Lawless, he spun around to face us and came over to join the conversation. Now remember, this man hears the names of the rich and famous dropped all the time. He probably serves the rich and famous all the time. It's his job to pretend he doesn't notice. And he does his job very well in the mundane world. But as soon as he heard me mention Lucy Lawless, the mundane shell dropped away and he turned into a fan. Both this waiter and, and the kinds of people who carry swords in, uh, in elevators at convention hotels are <laughs> displaying a trait that is epitomized, for better or worse, by the cruel mundane stereotype of SF fans wearing rubber Vulcan ears. In a sense, all of us, all SF fans, are forever carrying those rubber ears around, concealed in the pockets of our business suits, military uniforms, waiters' jackets, or doctors' smocks. No one knows they're there. But when we find ourselves around like-minded persons, even if they happen to be total strangers, we absentmindedly reach into our pockets, pull out the ears, and slap them on. We identify ourselves as geeks. We geek out. Lucy Lawless is one example of an actor with a bifurcated career, a topic I would like to explore for a few minutes. It might sound to you like a trivia game, but I think that it works as a kind of natural experiment that gives us information about the bifurcated culture. I first noticed this when I was watching the first Lord of the Rings movie and the character of Elrond made his first appearance. He looked strangely familiar to me. Later I looked him up on IMDB and figured out that he was, of course, the same guy who portrays Agent Smith in the Matrix movies. His name is Hugo Weaving. In the mundane world, he has a perfectly respectable career going. It is difficult to make a living as an actor. One has to be very good and to work very hard to make a go of it. Hugo Weaving has done this and has appeared in various mundane plays and films. If he'd never done any SF work at all, he'd have a career that other actors would envy. It's likely, however, that none of us would have seen him or heard of him because in the mundane world, he's not a huge star. In the SF world, he is one of the biggest stars of all time. Why the difference? What is it about him that accounts for this imbalance? Once I noticed this phenomenon, other examples came to mind. I've already mentioned Lucy Lawless, and it is by no means a historical curiosity because there are incipient bifurcated stars. The Sarah Connor Chronicles, a new TV series based on the Terminator movies, features two. Lena Hetty, who looked familiar to me because I'd previously seen her in 300 as the unfortunately named Gorgo, Queen of Sparta, and who, since I wrote this, uh, has got one of the leading roles in Game of Thrones as Cersei Lannister, by the way. Not, not to not to blow my own horn. Um, and Summer Glau, who played one of the characters on the SF series Firefly. <coughs> Sigourney Weaver has had a bifurcated career. Again, this isn't to say that she didn't do perfectly well for herself in mundane films and theatrical productions. In Alien and Aliens, though, she attained a level of fame that far exceeded her mundane work. And I don't think she would mind my saying so because she took a role in the film Galaxy Quest that made light of exactly this kind of situation. Is there any common thread linking the actresses I've mentioned? Lucy Lawless, Lena Headey, and Sigourney Weaver are all athletic, statuesque, good at doing action stuff. The cynical interpretation, then, is that male SF fans like to ogle Amazons. A more generous take on it is that SF is more forgiving towards strong women. I suspect that both of these are true, but they're not enough to explain the bifurcated career phenomenon. Galaxy Quest, of course, was transparently based on Star Trek, which brings to mind the archetypal bifurcated actor, Leonard Nimoy, who attained such perfection in his portrayal of Spock that it led to two unintended consequences. The one everyone knows about is that he afterwards 
found it difficult to get non-Vulcan work. <laughs> the less obvious one is that never again in the ongoing history of the franchise were the producers of any of those films or television episodes able to find an actor who could convincingly portray the Vulcan. Just as an exercise, I spent a while trying to think whether there was any actor, living or dead, who could possibly <coughs> portray a Vulcan as convincingly as Leonard Nimoy. I assumed that this experiment would end in failure, but surprisingly the answer came to me immediately. Hugo Weaving. <laughs> Hugo Weaving would make a totally convincing Vulcan, and it's not just because we've already seen him with pointy ears. <laughs> it's something else. I think that it is the ability to portray intelligence. When I first saw Weaving as Elrond, I didn't think I was going to like him because he looked very different from how I had imagined this character when I read The Lord of the Rings. But I ended up liking his performance very much. He was able to convince me that he really was a 3,000-year-old elf lord. Part of this is simply that he's a professional actor who's good at what he does, but it also, I'm convinced, has something to do with this ability to project intelligence. Consider some of the other characters in the Star Trek franchise. Out of the entire cast of Star Trek The Next Generation, I would say that the two most beloved successful characters, at least to fans in the SF world, are Commander Data, portrayed by Brent Spiner, and Jean-Luc Picard, played by Patrick Stewart. These are very different characters, but what they have in common is that they are intelligent people portrayed convincingly by actors who are either very intelligent or else good at seeming that way. Some other characters in this series did not ring true for SF fans in the same way. Going back to the female characters I was talking about earlier, I believe that the same is true. Oh, it helps that they are statuesque, beautiful, and athletic, but there is more to it than that. It is conspicuous in the first two Alien films that Sigourney Weaver's character is the smartest person in the room at any given time. The only possible exception is Bishop, the android in the second film, played by Lance Henriksen, in another fine example of an intelligence-projecting performance. One believes in this character in the same way that one believes in Nimoy's Spock, or that I, at least, believe in Weaving's Elrond. All of these characters can somehow convey that there is complexity behind the eyes. The intelligence of these characters isn't just a slapped-on trait. These are not token nerds thrown into an ensemble piece to solve technical problems. Their intelligence is an intrinsic reason why you are supposed to find them interesting, to identify with them. It is what makes them human, even, especially, when they are not actually humans. If the character can't portray that intelligence, if the actor can't portray that intelligence, the character fails altogether. Counterexamples are legion. We have all suffered through movies that were ruined by characters doing stupid things. The classic example is in suspense movies when someone, usually a pretty girl, is running away from a monster or a serial killer when she happens to trip and fall down, whereupon instead of simply getting back to her feet and running some more, she sits on the ground whimpering until the threat catches up with her. And we've all seen bad horror movies in which the protagonists blunder into situations that no one who has ever actually watched a bad horror movie would ever get into. <laughs> the satisfaction and the solace offered by good SF is that its characters don't behave that way. Consider how Ripley, the character played by Sigourney Weaver, responds to the threat posed by the aliens. In the second film, once she and the Marines she's with have made first contact with the aliens and had a chance to catch their breath, they very quickly agree that they should simply go back to the orbiting ship and nuke the place. It's a brilliant move on the part of the filmmakers precisely because it is the obvious and intelligent thing to do. It's exactly what we in the audience are all thinking to ourselves. But because it's a kind of horror movie, and we've been conditioned to expect stupid behavior from characters in horror movies, it's the last thing we're expecting. When the idea is raised and agreed on, we wake up, sit a little straighter in our chairs, and say, oh, this is a movie about real people, which is to say, people who behave intelligently. And for the rest of the film, that promise is largely borne out as Ripley goes on to do a number of more or less intelligent things, such as using a cigarette lighter to set off a fire alarm when she needs to draw the other's attention, and so on. So in SF, intelligence is just how people behave, and it's what you expect in a well-wrought piece. 
But by this definition, intelligence is something that has undergone some changes during the last 50 years or so. The Heinleinian hero who knows everything, who can do everything, is gone. The world is complicated. No one can be good at everything. I bought a new car a couple of weeks ago, and I still haven't read more than a few pages of the inch and a half thick pile of instruction books that came with it. It, like everything else in our lives, has too many features, too many details for our minds to hold. The best we can do is to be good at something or a few things. We come home tired and we feel the need to veg out. A recent coinage, meaning to drop voluntarily into a kind of vegetative coma, typically in front of the TV. I should know in my family, I'm infamous for my lowbrow tastes in entertainment. But many people, after they have vegged out long enough to recharge their batteries, derive fun and profound satisfaction from geeking out on whatever topic is of particular interest to them. Choose any person in the world at random, no matter how non-geeky they might seem, and talk to them long enough, and in most cases, you will eventually <coughs> hit on some topic about which they are exorbitantly knowledgeable, and, if you express interest, on which they are willing to talk enthusiastically for hours. You have found their inner geek. Sometimes the inner geek may be hidden very deeply indeed. The grizzled, taciturn machinist who normally speaks in sentences of one or two words will light up and deliver an extemporaneous dissertation about his favorite alloys of steel. The forklift operator at Walmart will turn out to be a Civil War reenactor who can recite the full history of the Battle of Shiloh down to the level of individual squads and soldiers. This is how knowledge works today, and it's how it's going to work in the future. No more Heinleinian polymaths. Instead, a web of geeks, each of whom knows a lot about something. Twenty years ago, we called them nerds, and we despised them. We didn't like the power that they seemed to have over the rest of us, and we identified them as something different from normal society. Now we call them geeks, and we like them just fine because they are us. Nerds were limited to math and science and computers. <laughs> geeks also do those kinds of things, which isn't saying much because everyone works with computers all the time now. But geeks can also be experts on welding or civil war battles or fine cabinet making. Everyone gets now that this is how society is going to work. And as long as geeks bathe frequently enough and don't commit the faux pas <laughs> of geeking out at the wrong time in the wrong company, it's OK. It's better than OK. It's desirable. We're all geeks now. But we're all geeks in different subject areas. And so the only thing that links us all together is what we watch on the tube when our geek energies have been spent and we feel the need to veg out the lowest common denominator stuff. Almost everyone knows and agrees that this material is idiotic. It doesn't reflect the way the world actually works because it doesn't contain as many geeks as the real world that we all inhabit. In that sense, it's more unrealistic, more fantastical than the material that actually gets tagged as fantasy. It is when we turn on a movie or a television show and observe people behaving intelligently that we sit up a little straighter in our seats and get interested, begin to take the story and its characters a little more seriously.